Assalamu alaikum and good evening everyone. I am Awas and I will be hosting today's webinar session. First of all, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of DICE Analytics to the round six of webinar series Deep Learning and Artificial Intelligence. I am glad to introduce you our speaker today, Mr. Albab Khan, who not only happens to be an efficient deep learning engineer, but also leading advanced machine learning training at DICE Analytics. His key expertise are in domains of machine learning, deep learning, data mining, data-driven marketing, and data prediction. It's a great opportunity for those who want to explore about the advancements and industrial implication of AI technology. In today's session, you will be exploring about data science versus deep learning. You will know about the deep learning flow and Python, its tools and technologies, its applications. You will also be guided about how you can kickstart your career in this domain and what skill set is required for it. It's a request to all the attendees to note your questions during the session and ask your queries in the Q&A session at the end. Thank you so much. Over to Mr. Albab. Uh, hello, everybody. So, everybody can hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. All right, guys. So I think everybody can hear me. Uh, thank you so much, Aves. Thanks for the brief introduction. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the webinar for deep learning for AI, uh, or you can also call it advanced machine learning. Uh, previously, we had a couple of uh, webinars related to big data, uh, similarly data sciences. Uh, carried out by Omer. Uh, similarly, uh, there were other some uh, some webinars related to the to the domain of uh, in data analytics. So in this uh, webinar, uh, as already Oves has mentioned about the, the the outline that what we are going to cover in this webinar, uh, but I would be uh, briefly telling you about what we are going to do there. Basically, we will see why and how. Uh, deep learning is different from data sciences. Uh, what are the uh, career perspectives for this domain? Uh, what are the concepts or the points which you should uh, keep in mind? Or, and like while making this uh, path as a career, and uh, whether you are a student or you are uh, a data scientist in any in any organization or you are uh, trying to make a new startup based on the deep learning products or anything like that. So uh, a quick, uh, uh, before my introduction, I uh, would like to share my screen with all of you guys. Okay, so uh, my let me start with my introduction. So basically, my full name is Albab Ahmed Khan. I am a data scientist based in Pakistan. Uh, I have worked for uh, several uh, startups, government organizations, as well as private uh, organizations in uh, deep learning, uh, NLP, data sciences, machine learning, like the stuff which usually data scientists do. So uh, some of the organizations with which I was associated in the in the past were uh, uh, research labs of NAST 
then a uh, corporate organization in this in box business technologies uh, then i worked for telenor for some time and uh, similarly these days i am a senior data scientist in zong china mobile company uh, china mobile pakistan actually and i also uh, teach uh, deep learning and data sciences in dyson analytics and uh, in some of the universities as a visiting lecturer for master's program in computer vision and ai so that's my brief introduction uh, in this webinar i want to ask some of the participants about their backgrounds one uh, like three or four participants as we have a long list of participants here so it won't be uh, practically practically possible uh, to have the introduction from everybody so uh, i want to ask people what their uh, basically previous uh, job roles were what you guys have been doing uh, what are the expectations from this uh, webinar and uh, what do you see uh, your career going towards deep learning or stuff like that so can we start from uh, any person amar azhar are you available amar you can unmute the mic yes yeah, amar you can unmute if you want to uh, i guess amar is not available uh, any other person who wants to talk who wants to uh share his experience uh just just let me know uh faisal mughal Hello, am I audible? Yeah, I can hear you, Asim. Okay, so it's uh, Asim Rahman here, a computer science graduate from Pakistan. Uh, Asim, there is there's a there's some voice distortion distortion at your end. It's, it's really hard to hear you. Now clear? Yeah, now now I can hear you. okay i am a computer science graduate from fas national university and uh, i have done internship as a data scientist at five river technologies in which i worked in the computer vision domain so i am also interested in data science side plus also interesting in the advanced analytics side so i came here to explore the both sides of the career because now i am willing to make it a full time career in data science domain okay thank you so much for your uh basically your your background uh, i am happy that you are here and uh, i'm pretty sure that this webinar would help a lot in like trying to organize your career and trying to give it a right direction that what you are going to do in the future and how will you like transform your career in the future thank you so much uh, okay let's move to the next participant uh fawad naeem are you with us farooq raza uh, listen you can unmute can you please yeah. sorry there's a lot of background noise okay yeah. that's better yeah. actually uh yeah. hi my name is hasan ali uh um Uh, like yourself albab i'm a graduate of nast and a graduate of udacity um i've been working across uh, many um, multiple different industries um in analytics in visual uh, data visualization business intelligence um data warehousing and uh, a lot of python development work and um yeah at the moment i'm working with lendlease um it's um, a construction company that basically does uh, data analytics on all of the um basically every operation that goes in construction of a building and um so get all the data on a central platform analyze it and then be able to uh find the most optimal solution for you know like the construction and the finances and uh, so yeah it's a whole lot a whole lot of other uh, other things uh what i want to get out of this webinar is basically a, a general introduction to the ai and the advanced machine learning side of things I've done a little bit of machine learning but I'm hoping to explore this area a little more. So yeah, that's me. 
uh, thank you so much hasan thanks for your background uh, i hope uh, this webinar would help a lot in like understanding the differences between the machine learning and deep learning where we have to like go to uh, the ai part other than that uh, in our daily jobs or in our daily tasks or problems what we are facing right now so uh, what 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 is the exact point where we have to like uh, shift from a conventional machine learning algorithm or the or, or formula mathematical formula to a advanced you know weight based uh, optimization technique so when when we have to do that what are the trigger points so the, i think this this webinar will be very much helpful to you as well as some other participants as well so i would like to have one or two more introductions so let's uh, go down and see okay uh, mr khurum shahzad if you can like say some words uh, or ms marim feroz um hello am i audible yeah um hi everyone my name is maryam and um i am currently studying at habib university in karachi i am in my senior year for communication and design and i am actually taking this course because for my final year um this webinar sorry um because for my final year project i am working on uh basically something related to artificial intelligence with a group of computer scientists who are also seniors um at habib university um honestly speaking i'm here because i really want to see and understand what exactly artificial intelligence is how it works and how as a designer i can become a part of this rapidly growing um industry in pakistan and of course um what role can i play as a designer in this industry yeah okay thank you so much mariam thanks for your uh sharing your background and and uh, being being very honest about the feed about the fab you are doing right now so uh well it really depends that uh, what sort of uh, ai based project you are doing whether it really needs ml whether it really needs uh, deep learning or dl or uh, it can be uh, like a rule based framework anything like that so it really depends upon how you actually design that particular uh solution of the problem and uh, how you actually see the how, how should be the output so it really depends upon all these factors actually so yeah we'll be quickly covering most of the perspectives over here and i hope uh, you'll get to know about you'll be clear about what what you will be doing in the uh, in your fip or in any sort of fip whether it's related to computer vision or it's related to natural language processing or a uh, simple you know classification or regression sort of problem is there so it really depends so what we are working right now so let's uh, have one volunteer for the, and it's our last one because i will be moving towards the lecture so anybody from the audience who wants to speak so please let me know uh, i can uh, unmute you guys ah uh, okay is there anybody or we should start now uh we have uh sitwat tarik zishan ali if you guys can share your experiences uh west kani Okay, guys. Let's start the webinar. Uh, all right. So, guys, if you have any questions, please note them down. We'll have a separate Q&A session at the end of the lecture. Uh, if, at the end of this webinar, where we'll be uh, like looking into the questions of most of the participants, uh, I'll I'll try my best to like address most of the questions in the last fifteen or twenty minutes. 
and the uh, rest of the time we'll spend on like covering the whole ecosystem of AI and deep learning and data sciences. Okay, so let's start guys. So basically, uh, before getting into uh, the term AI or deep learning, I want to uh, give a little introduction about the data sciences. I hope most of the people over here uh, are familiar with this concept that it's basically the combination of three main, uh, you know, uh, uh, things. One of them is like, if you should be very much pro or champ at uh, computer science or IT skills, I mean to say you, you should be very much proficient in programming, then you should be very good at the domain knowledge on which you're working right now. For example, if you are solving a medical related problem, medical sciences related problem, you should precisely know what are the trigger points, what are the, what are the main uh, points uh, which you should consider, then you should be really good at mathematics and mathematical skills. So if you combine basically maths and domain knowledge, uh, both of them, so basically you try to see, okay, what is uh, where the research is right now? What is the future perspective of this particular problem which you're facing right now? And what has been done in the few, in the in the past actually? So this this term calls, uh, we, we call it as traditional research in you know um, the whole life cycle of the data sciences then if you are good at it skills and you are good at mathematics as well so basically combining both of them so you try to uh, teach machines how to learn the data and how to make the decisions out of the data so basically it and uh, mathematics both of them combine to make uh, a stream named as uh, machine learning and then uh, computer science and it skills and domain knowledge both of them uh, combine together they form uh, software development. This is, this is a conventional software development which you usually do. For example, if I am working in uh, organization in, in named as uh, Alibaba or Daraz and I have a particular problem to like sell any uh, MacBook. So what I'll do is that I'll make a banner or I'll make an app uh, for my company to sell that particular, you know, uh, MacBook and design a database at the back end so that whenever a customer orders that MacBook, it should be uh, stored in my data warehouse that, okay, this order has been placed from which lat and which long and uh, what is the price which he's trying to, you know, uh, pay and how much he wants to do in on the installment basis. And that's, that's, that's basically the core software development, which is uh, the combination of computer science and IT skills, as well as the domain of business knowledge. Uh, so where comes the data science part? So basically when you learn how to develop apps or softwares, whether they are in Java or they're in PHP, they're in Angular or uh, any JavaScript, uh, uh, you know, language or, or whether you are a good iOS developer or an Android developer. And then you know how to uh, feed data to the machines and you can get the output from the machines as well, rather than uh, pushing your uh, knowledge to the, uh, to the machine every time while making a decision, you try to engage or you try to enable or uh, make a machine so much intelligent that it should make the scene on behalf of you. Uh, so combining software development, uh, mach machine learning, or you know, trying to uh, give machine that capability to learn and decide. And then you should know how to do traditional research. It means that you, sh you should know that the problem on which you're uh, focusing right now is your answer or is your uh, output that much precise enough or not. So if it's not much precise, so you have to, research and you have to see okay what needs to be done to like improve it so basically combining all of them uh, makes you a data scientist actually uh now the question is where comes the deep learning part so for example uh, while doing uh okay just hold on okay uh, so you get to know so you get to know that while doing the research and while uh, you see that, okay, this is the best formula or the algorithm which you can implement on your data uh, while you have an app or you have a software right over there, but the output is not coming good. So the output is not that much precise or accurate. So what has to be done? So you need to be, uh, you need to optimize your algorithm or you need to optimize the system on the basis of which you are making a decision actually, or you have to make it, make it more accurate. Uh, this is the one example. This is the one part from which uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, looking into into one perspective. And the other perspective is, for example, uh, deep learning is usually used in, in most of the organizations where you have to automate the systems, actually. So based on uh, the, the conventional machine learning procedure where you 
feed the data to the model, model decides the output, you uh, try to engage that output into in, in the business. Uh, and after some time, the results start decreasing and you have to like automate it and you have to retrain it again. So instead of doing that process again and again and again, you try to optimize that part. So basically, whenever we uh, try to improve this part, so this is improved with the help of deep learning actually. So uh, it's not it's not confined to this part only that you have to only optimize the systems, but, but, but it also depends upon the different parameters where we actually see that, okay, the application of deep learning is much way broader in uh, vision industry, in uh, textual data, in, in, in unstructured textual data, trying to get the right information from the raw texts. Uh, which we usually call natural language processing. Then uh, cancer prediction is there. You have to see what's going on in the medical sciences and how uh, deep learning or this this whole domain can uh, enable those doctors and those paramedical staff to actually fight from with the diseases. So how to identify or, or, or find the right output for, for a particular disease or, or identify that particular disease in, in no time. So that all comes under the umbrella of this deep learning actually. So uh, this is a quick, uh, you know, uh, background uh, for the problem, starting from the problem, designing the solution, uh, making a model for it, deploying it on any machine and then getting the output. So some of the people might be aware of this, but some of the people are here, which uh, really don't know what, what this is all about. So let me be very quick on this slide. So basically, uh, whether you are designing any deep learning or any machine learning pr uh, problem, so the, the problem starts coming from, uh, the, 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 the solution starts uh, coming from an actual question or actual problem that what is the problem? For example, uh, we have a very basic example question of, uh, and the question is that, uh, for example, I work in WHO uh, and uh, I have to see that, okay, uh, which, what are the areas where polio is, you know, aggressively growing? So the question is, you have to forecast or you have to predict the areas where the uh, polio is growing. So what you need to do is that you, you, you actually design the problem. Now you have to look into the data acquiring procedure that you need to see where from where I can get the data, whether I have to go to uh, the people, I have to do the surveys, I have to go to hospitals, I have to collect all the information of the of the children uh, below the age of five or uh, be, below the age of 10. Uh, then I have to go into the areas and uh, collect the samples from, uh, you know, different uh, sites, for example, the drainage areas, uh, try to see what particular chemicals are there to help us in order to find that polio, uh, whether it is there or not, then we have to get the data of those areas where polio is way too much and the areas where the polio is not way, not that much aggressive. So it means that we have, we have locked the problem. We have started acquiring the data. Now we need to translate that data into uh, a, a semantic in form. For example, we need to aggregate the data on daily basis or weekly basis or monthly or annual uh, basis. So it, it really depends that how you need to transform that data. So in, in, in that particular scenario, you see that, uh, Business owner decides the problem. That what is the problem? That that was the polio. Polio is the one observation. Then we uh, try to acquire the data by setting with data engineers or or ETL people or the sourcing people. Then we set with the data pipeline people, uh, data engineers or ETL developers to to like store that data into our DB and in into while on the. On, daily basis or weekly or monthly, whether it really depends on the problem, how we want our data. Then here in the next part, we data analysts or we data, data scientists try to make the uh, make an actual sense out of the data that what the data is telling us, whether it's giving us the right answer, which we're looking for. Uh, are there any good parameters which can help us to like uh, formulate the output or formulate the, or, or address the question? And if they are good to go, then we need to visualize them because I cannot look into all the you know rows and columns in the data how they look like. So we need to be very much uh, you know 
we need to know the information that how we can translate that data and how we can record that data in, in, into a well-structured form. Uh, then once, we, let's suppose you have all the parameters and they are in place, for example, you know, okay, drainage data is important, uh, hospitals data is important, uh, survey data is very much important of, of a particular lo locality. Then we will use all of these parameters and we'll try to push it to a, a particular algorithm or a formula over here. Uh, here, the data science and the machine learning engineer actually works or a deep learning engineer actually works, which basically try to find a particular, the best fit model or the best fit algorithm to train the data on that algorithm, build the data, build the model, try to optimize your uh, and, and try to minimize the error of your equations which you are on the basis of which you are trying to uh, solve the problem and then you validate that data. For example, uh, you teach a particular formula, a particular data, you uh, try to validate that, that okay, whether the equation has uh, completely learned this data or not, or you, uh, based on that, you actually validate that data uh, validate the model and and if the model is validated then you go and you try to deploy that model into the production where you actually starts looking into okay on on the real back on the real uh scenario real situation which are the particular areas of the prime hotspots where polio is uh you know uh getting way too much worse or, or which are the areas where where we are able to control the polio through our team so this 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 actually how it works so uh, after some time most likely after five months six months depends upon the problem how critical the problem is uh you have to like test the models again uh, like okay now you have deployed a particular model based on the best algorithm which you have selected, whether it comes from the deep learning or it comes from uh, conventional machine learning models, uh, there is a long set of models which you can use to solve your problem, whether they are SVM, naive base, uh, random forest, logistic regression, XE boost, ADA boost, et cetera, CAT, CAT boost, et cetera, any, any, any sort of model is there. Or you are going for advanced models. For example, you are looking into uh, CNNs or RNNs or GANs or anything like that. Based on the maximum knowledge which you have, you designed a model, you deployed that particular model, now you have to test that model. And, and the testing means uh, over here that this is a, this is a testing after deployment. For example, after six months, the data evolve actually uh, and the problems evolve actually. So in, in that particular term, our solutions also need to be evolved. So we need to retest our uh, already built pipelines in that in in that in the models, and we need to retrain the data uh, or the or the algorithm to gain that those optimized results. Uh, some of the people over here get confused that okay, what is the validation then, and what's the what's the testing part? So the the difference between the validation and the testing is that while you are trying to make a model, for example, I am collecting the samples in July. I do out of time testing on August, for example, I collected the data, I tried to train a model on, on the July data. I tested the model on August data. So it means that I did out of time testing, okay? I collected samples again and I tried to see, okay, what are the prime hotspots? Now I've deployed the model. Uh, it is very much giving me accurate results, for example, 90 to 92%. And now uh, the model has been deployed. Now what I need to do is that I need to see after five to six months that, okay, whether my model is performing good or not. If it's performing good, then let it be there. Let, let the deployed model give you the right results, which you're, what you were looking for. But if the results are, you know, uh, they, they have started containing some error in it or, or the uh, models are not that much precise now. So you need to like retrain the whole, of, the whole system again. So this line goes back over here and it actually starts retaining the model. So this line means that now you need to again see the variables that, okay, whether the new variables should be there or not. Okay, one more thing which we, we need to discuss over here that uh, why deep learning is better as compared to machine learning. I, I'll briefly discuss in the upcoming slides as well, but over here, just uh, like keep it this way, that uh, in deep learning, in the machine learning, there is, uh, a lot of manual work which you are doing, like you have, you are trying to select the parameters or attributes. Okay, this needs to, uh, we think this is important. We think this is important, this is important. Let's put it in the model and let's see where, what results come out, out from this. In deep learning, uh, we try to 
automate this whole system, like the selection of all the model of the algorithms is actually based on the weights. So you randomly initialize the weights, you try to optimize the output, and then you see that, okay, where the error is. So uh, the, the, the cumbersome process, which actually takes a lot of time to like explore into the variables that reduces a lot. And then in the, in the final, you need to know how the storytelling is there, like what are the steps you took actually, and you finally met the output. Okay, let's move forward. Okay, so let's talk about AI. AI is all around you guys, whether you are in a self-driving car, you are uh, using your smartphone or your laptops, or uh, you, are, uh, you, are, you have set up a home automation system in your homes, uh, you have solar uh, system in your home or in an office, et cetera, like that, whether you are uh, working in a robotics company or uh, you are on the street, where uh, the, the system is all automated in, in the form of traffic lights. So this all comes under the umbrella of AI. So it means whenever you try to uh, make a, a conditional statement for a problem to design its solution, uh, you are actually the part of AI actually. So usually whenever people think about AI, looking into all the uh, perspective, perspectives in the, in, the, in the former slide, which I have discussed. So people really think that something, this would be uh, the, the definition of AI, but actually AI deals with a lot of integrals, a lot of differentials and a lot of back propagation, power propagation, error terms and uh, grading descents are there. So it means uh, you have to deal with a lot of mathematics in this, uh, in this niche, you know, uh, uh, framework where, uh, on the daily basis, you have to look into the data, you have to restructure your algorithms or the mathematical equations, and you actually try to optimize your outputs based on uh, those advanced you know, uh, models, whether they are uh, CNNs or RNNs or fully connected layers or multi-layer perceptrons, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it actually uh, is related to mathematics a lot. So uh, some of the people in the bachelors also think that, okay, we had learned ODEs, differentials, and integrals, but we never use them in, in, our, uh, in our lives. But uh, this, this deep learning is the part where you actually implement the, that uh, you know, differential and that integral. And you actually see how that integral or differential is helping you to get to your output actually. So how uh, you are trying to optimize your output based on our differential, based on the taking the differential of, differentials of your weights, along with uh, of your error along, uh, with the, with respect to your weights and you get your uh, and you get to the right output so this is a this is a term where people usually get uh, confused that okay uh, when whenever we look into a jd of any uh, job in the market for example uh, there is a job of the java developer so people uh, start applying on that job and there is a there is a term written as uh, we need three years or five years of working experience uh, of a person who is applying for this particular job so it means that uh, the, the experience what the people demand for a particular developer is the amount of time he has spent on uh, like solving the problem in a full-time job or in a part-time job anything like that uh, and he has uh, developed systems in Java actually. But for machine learning uh, or, or, or a model, what, what is the experience? So for a machine learning model, the experience is the data. So you actually uh, get the experience from the data. You try to train that data to your model and the model starts giving you the predictions. So this is the four step process. The experience comes from the data. Data is trained to a particular mathematical equation and right after the training, that mathematical equation starts giving you the uh, prediction of the trends. So in the next slide, actually, people really ask that what, what's the difference between AI or ML or DL? So, so there, is a, there is a little confusion between all these terms. So the AI is actually a, a bigger umbrella, which actually covers ML and the, the, the niche part is DL. So AI means whenever you'll write a false condition or you write a, a set of conditions where you give the command to your system that, okay, if this happens, you have to do this, if this happens, you have to do this, and if this happens, you have to do this. So all the those particular basic commands which we used to write in early 1960s and 70s, that all came under 
in the umbrella of uh, AI actually. The machine learning uh, part started existing when we targeted all that frameworks and we tried to make them into the uh, packages. And those packages actually start working on behalf of us to solve the, to learn the data and to somehow give you some outputs like uh, basic regression, basic classification, uh, then we saw associations and then, you know, the list goes on and on. Then came the deep learning part. Now in the early 2010 onwards, uh, we are looking into this deep learning with the boom and, and the boom is that uh, all the, the systems which we have made till now, they were kind of manual systems which we are actually training based on the learning of our on the basis of the data on the on the past uh, data. Uh, now the deep learning actually automates all that ecosystem and uh, and tries to form the output based on its own learning. So it's try it tries to optimize the output on every step. Tries to learn from the parameters. Try to give you the output again. Try tries to learn from the parameters and give you the output. So the weights over here is actually. Uh, play an important role in like learning. They kind of uh, make make a major breakthrough uh, as compared to uh, machine learning. In the past 60 minutes, we were discussing the previous slide. Uh, multiple data sources had created a lot of data in in our uh, ecosystem. So talking about some of the giants over here, uh, you can see that. Skype has more than 2 million minutes of calls which have been done. So imagine the amount of information we can uh, collect from there and imagine the amount of customer experience which we can improve based on uh, the service which the customers are using, whether they're using Snapchat or Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Like, uh, for example, we are working in Google and uh, on, on, on one one minute, you are getting around 300 million searches. Uh, it's, it's, the numbers can be somewhere, uh, these are the approximate numbers actually, but 300 million searches are over there. So it means that we can get impel data in like 15 minutes and that can be more than 57 million searches. Uh, and they, they can be on the Google and based on those 57 million searches on the Google in the 15 minutes, imagine the amount of uh, data you can collect and you can understand your customer, what he is trying to search, what he's trying to find, uh, what is the right output you should give to your customers, stuff like that. So it means the data is growing aggressively on the larger basis, larger scale. While the data is increasing a lot, so it means that a lot of computational power should be there. If the lot of computational power is there, so it means now the problems are not simpler problems. They are also complex ones. So now you need to have the systems which are which are capable to solve the complex problems based on lots and lots of data. So over here, uh, when we talk about complex problems and designing the solutions for those complex problems from the lots and lots of data, uh, there's one more thing which we uh, keep in mind, and that is if I'm going with some machine learning, most of the machine learning algorithms, so by the amount of data, the increasing amount of data, my performance after some time would uh, be stagnant or, or, or would be continuous. It, it, it won't grow with respect to the amount of data, how the data is increasing. So over here, some people ask that how the performance is. So this performance is based on the accurate, uh, the, like the accurate performance is there or lesser time, uh, lesser time is required in getting more, uh, better better output. So, but in the, in the meanwhile, if we try to, implement the deep learning algorithms and then the same time. So you can see that the, the, the curve goes on and on. And the, and the learning of the curve, the curve is much, way much better in performance as compared to most of the machine learning algorithms. So that's why the, the DL or the deep learning is our, uh, you know, go to uh, solution in this particular term. So what's the deep learning analogy? Uh, basically deep learning actually is driven from uh, you know human brain or human neurons which we uh, have you know uh, studied till now so basically in human neuron what happens is that uh, lots of you know exons or dendrites actually lots of dendrites actually pass the information to a particular neuron over here uh, and here that the scene actually uh, takes place that whether uh, a human body needs to uh, 
give its output to the input what, what's coming for example if you are on electric uh, circuit electric you are about to get electric shock and you actually get electric shock so dendrites actually give the input to the nucleus based on the impulses which they created that okay we got electric shock so here over here in this brain we actually decided okay uh, i need to uh, pull back my uh, arm or hand or anything like that what, what's actually connected to that uh, you know electric circuit or electric board. So based on that, we actually give act uh, orders to the exons or the terminal branches of the exons to, to pull out the hand actually. So in that particular term, while we look into the biological neuron, we'll translate into the mathematical neuron actually. So in the mathematical neuron, what happens is that you get the inputs from these X1, X2, X3, up till Xn, all the different uh, parts of uh, the whole uh, the whole solution. These weights are the impulses actually. Now they are responsible for getting the data. These they are responsible for getting the data like W one, W two, W three, W four, and and they provide the inputs and the impulses or the weights to the same area where you actually combine both of them try to to find the solution. And then you provide it uh, to activation function, which actually decides, okay, do this, okay, do that, okay, don't do this, don't do that. It actually decides now. So the activation function performs the action. This uh, sigma or the or the linear uh, function actually LF linear function actually decides what needs to be done. This actually performs that output. Now we can see that whether the output is good or not, whether this uh, step function or the activation function is good or not, we need to rechange or we need to use a better activation function over here. Uh, how, how, what should be that? So it really depends on that now. So artificial networks they, they are based on so uh, all these, this whole ecosystem which we have discussed previously in the previous slide that was a perceptron actually. So the, co the, the combination of all of the perceptrons on different layers is uh, actually formulates the output. So it means you have multiple layers and those multiple uh, uh, layers, the hidden layers are actually responsible for uh, driving the output uh, based on some inputs. So over here, this this was perceptron one, then perceptron two, then three and four. They actually decided based on the set of inputs, they decided an output, that output is translated into the next uh, on as an input with the help of a particular weight. So this line is actually a weight now, just like this. So the weights actually decide that, okay, how the output should become, and that uh, that makes the output. So there are major revolutions in IT, which came, uh, like computers came into existence, then home automation came into existence, then smartphone, smartphones were there. And now the next major revolution is uh, deep learning, which will actually automate most of the uh, solutions in our in in our surroundings so that's that's um, one of the major revolution in it some of the practical applications in uh, deep learning are nlp expert systems planning and optimization systems uh, speech in, in let's let's talk about speech where you can make systems like text to speech or speech to text and image recognition or vision is there where you actually try to make machine uh, machine vision models or image recognition models like face recognition or object localization, object recognition, trying to identify different diseases from the images or the live stream videos or trying to make your, your area safe. Similarly, uh, data extraction, classification and translation are some of the examples of NLP where you can like uh, enable yourselves to implement most of the text actually. Uh, then comes the next slide where uh, you actually look into uh, computer vision. So trying to uh, look into uh, the, the live or real time uh, decision making for uh, self-driving cars or find, finding the right optimal uh, path for your car all comes under the computer vision. This computer vision, this is not limited to only this example, but, but, but it's the, the umbrella is very, very much vast. So this is just one example that you can take uh, that how self-driving cars actually work, that how it tries to identify the next car or the or, or the signals or the, or the road, the roads or the lines actually trying to identify the range of the vehicles based on the uh, data coming from the sensors as well as the live stream 
uh, videos that that all comes under this uh, computer vision. Then there is another example of uh, deep learning, as I have mentioned in the other slide, that uh, speech recognition is um, very hot these days. So based on the speech recognition, you can identify what what is the owner of the speech or or the or the voice which is coming. Apart from that, how you can translate that machine that uh, input to any uh, particular product to in order to uh, give to your customers and uh, make their experience better. Uh, then NLP is already there. We have talked about a lot. Uh, talked a lot about this. Uh, you can make chatbots in a, uh, in NLP, and you you can like interact with any organization. Like replacing the customer service representatives is uh, the next thing which we are doing right now. Trying to suggest different products to our uh, people, our customers, our patients, our anything who is like relevant to that chatbot. Uh, like now, instead of like dealing with the people, dealing with the customers or the people in the in the in the new era, uh, we will replace the chatbots. Actually, and people are actually replacing like the banks and fintech is doing this this stuff a lot. So then, some cool application related to the use of the of. Of the world is like making the image captions, trying to make different filters and convolving the images with the filters to uh, be be more cool. Uh, this all comes under this 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 uh, umbrella where uh, image captioning is one example that uh, based on the image, the machine actually starts suggesting the caption. Uh, what you actually go and see into the Google that okay, what should be the best caption for my uh, image? Uh, so so that's another example of deep learning where. Uh, you can see a man in the in the black T-shirt is playing the guitar, or a, or a person is working on the road, or a small kid is actually playing with the Lego toy. So those are all examples of image captioning. Then comes the cancer prediction example. So the application of uh, one of the very important application of uh, deep learning is the prediction of cancer, whether that that is coming from the CT scans or MRI or uh, you know different. Uh, source of uh, information where you actually try to forecast and predict how the cancer would look like in the upcoming stages, uh, what needs to be done right now to stop that particular cancer, uh, which is a, which is very much important to, to like serve the humanity these days. Now, apart from that, some other examples of cancer is there to like uh, identification of the skin cancer or lung cancer or kidney cancer or, or any sort of cancer in, in the body is there. Apart from that, uh, some other examples, for example, trying to uh, find the solutions for your eyes or trying to find the solution or, or, or fixing the problems of your body, for example, uh, looking into the X-rays, trying to find the uh, problem in in the X-rays, so that's uh, for for the uh, you know bones and stuff like that. So that's another example of this. So machine translation is another example of deep learning, which is very much efficient these days. Like uh, trying to uh, make the bag of words, trying to uh, identify the complete sentences and translating them into the other uh, you know example or other. Uh, language so that's all that all comes under this particular uh, thing then comes the next example that is post generation that uh, human body uh, has a particular pose and it, it's 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 uh, how it, it can be changed so so that that is also an example of post generation in the end of the exercise in of this webinar i'll, I'll quickly uh, show you guys a, a very good example of tensorflow where the post generation has a built in api so most of the models have, are you now api based where you can like fetch the api solve the problem uh, you, you don't have to train the models already the models have been trained the deep deep learning models have been trained and you can just use them on on one click on one click away so there are some of the other examples like post generation as well. So then we have neural story transfer that based on that, like transfer uh, Snapchat or Instagram or WhatsApp or other, uh, you know, uh, applications actually try to fill, convolve the filters with your uh, images and those give the outputs uh, in, a, in a very unique form and in a very cool way. So that's another example of deep learning, which is being done uh, previously. Uh, then comes music generation, like uh, based on the interest of your own in, 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 the, in the music industry, how you want to listen to the particular music, whether you want to generate a new music for yourself based on the past history, what you like actually. So that's also uh, a practical application of 
you know this uh, deep learning frameworks uh, apart from that we uh, also have some applications for example like uh, face recognition face generation models are there so for example there are two uh, images right in front of you all of you guys so uh, the the simple question which i can ask anybody uh, from the audience is like which are the uh, from the two faces which which one is the uh, original one and which one is the fake or the machine generated so the answer to that question is that both of the images right on your screen is are actually uh, machine generated so they are not uh, real images so they are neural network based and neural networks based on the features from millions of images have created all both of these images so you can imagine or you can check the quality of the image which it has created and the realness which uh, appears from this this particular image uh, apart from that some of the applications are also there in precision medicine uh, trying to track uh, uh, text, uh, transcript the text from the lip movement or trying to restore, restore the sound in a particular video, or trying to enhance the image through GANs or uh, pixel restoration is there or you're working with OCR. So all of them are actually giving may, very good performance as compared to uh, human performance. So, so the performance is very better uh, these days. So that's why deep learning is our next go to the solution. Then some of the applications, for example, like Spotify has uh, this uh, AI or, or deep learning engaged in the models where the recommendations are based on the deep learning models for, uh, and, and in, comp in comp competition to uh, SoundCloud, they have the three times bigger base as compared to SoundCloud and, and in, in the few years uh, previously. That's all because they try to understand their customer and try to develop the products for the customer based on the AI and deep learning, which wasn't currently being done in uh, Snapchat. So some of the industry leaders are Facebook, uh, Google, and Microsoft. All of them are actually developing a lot of uh, frameworks in, in deep learning. So most of the frameworks which have been developed till now are Cafe, TensorFlow, Thano, CNTK, or PyTorch, or TensorFlow. Uh, all of them have been uh, you know, uh, made till now. And based on that, you can like solve the problem. So there is a, a battle going on between TensorFlow or PyTorch. So basically, uh, it really depends upon the problem on which you are working, by, uh, whether it's uh, applicable or it's good in PyTorch or it's good in TensorFlow. So you can uh, opt one of them uh, based on that. So uh, the, the tools which usually we use in deep learning, uh, whole ecosystem are Python, Jupyter, Anaconda. Uh, apart from that, we use Keras, TensorFlow, Scikit-learn, uh, PyTorch as well, and, and some other libraries like Theano, uh, OpenCV, uh, as well as uh, Har Cascade functions so are, are there to like get the live stream data, trying to process uh, that data and uh, getting the output, for example. Uh, these are some of the examples, some of the commands which uh, you guys can use to like uh, enable the Conda environment in your systems to like uh, enable yourselves to start working in it. Then we have some other pack, uh, packages over here to like how to install any package, whether you want um, Plotly or SciPy or anything like that or beautiful. So to like scrap the data from the internet and, and make some uh, uh, solution for that through beautiful soap. So you can do that. So all of them are over here. And the cheat sheet is also available. You guys can use that. Uh, Jupyter, uh, most of you guys must be well aware of the Jupyter. So basically you are a user over here at that point and you are interacting with the browser. The browser can be uh, Google Chrome or, or any Mozilla Firefox or your Internet Explorer. And actually that goes back to the notebook server where it actually looks into a notebook and tries to see the resources which are available through kernel, whether you want a, um, you want the GPU or CPU or your or the data from the webcam or your uh, you know microphones or any sensor. So all are all are them available to this notebook server and in that way you interact with that. So basically based on the whole ecosystem. So if you want to install Jupyter on your system, so you can simply use uh, Conda install Jupyter or Conda install uh, NV underscore Conda. So that's the combination of actually Julia Python and R. So the packages coming from the Python R as well as Julia, all of them are integrated into the uh, Jupyter. Some of the packages which are very hot favorite in the uh, deep learning uh, frameworks are NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, SciPy, apart from that, Plotly is there. Uh, then we have some uh, cool, uh, you know, 
uh, libraries, for example, uh, text block for NLP, uh, Gerdin for NLP. Similarly, uh, for classification or regression, we have a, a long list of libraries uh, in uh, uh, Python as well, uh, where you can use uh, Keras and TensorFlow to like feed the networks and get the output. Uh, the frameworks which are mostly widely used over here are TensorFlow and Keras. Now, uh, TensorFlow is at the back end of the Keras, so you interact with Keras and it automatically calls all the resources which are required for any particular model uh, with TensorFlow. The book which usually I recommend to the people and it's a free, you guys can like uh, go and get a PDF uh, from online, is the Deep Learning by Ian Goodfellow. You guys can like take it as a reference book to like solve most of the problems which you are trying to uh, you know see whether those are uh, related to uh, GANs or uh, you know reinforcement learning or simple classification or regression problems so you can uh, use that okay uh, then we have a, a basic uh, you know architecture over here that okay now you know how to get the inputs those are uh, three inputs over here like x1 x2 and x3 over here and those are actually X3, all of them are, uh, you know, combined with the weights and you fed them into a uh, input uh, where actually a function does its magic and you give, and it gives you the output in the form of zero to one. So actually a uh, sigma function is uh, usually applied over here to get, uh, to give you the output and the formula for that sigma function is over there uh, where you actually find the output from here. So that output is actually X. So this X uh, goes over here. Uh, into e to the power, raised power and it starts giving the probability between zero and one actually. So uh, the, the whole formula uh, becomes just like this. For example, this minus 0 0.06 multiplies with the weight. Uh, then it comes over here. You add all of the values and then you make a x and that x goes into this formula and in, then you get the output. So it means that this 21 is actually fed into this uh, activation function which is named, which is called over here and that activation function gives you the output in the form of 0 to 1 so it means if the value is 21 so the output is somewhere around 0 0.93 uh, percent the probability would be there that okay, this belongs to one class which is this one so it means that uh, over here what what is our data what's what's our uh, weight and how we are trying to get the output so it means that we have different fields for example these are, this is our data. These are the classes which are we trying to identify actually. We are trying to predict or classify. So we train the neural network actually. How we train it? We initialize some random weights which are on these you know, locations. Over here, there are all random weights which are initialized in the, in the, in the, in the start, starting point. You try to get this data. For example, 1.4 comes here, 2.7 comes here, and 1.9 comes here. And based on that, you try to teach your model that, okay, the output would be zero. So now learn this pattern, then come to the next, uh, uh, you know, observation, learn pattern again, come, come down, learn pattern again, come down, learn pattern again. So in that particular scenario, you give the data to the model and you try to see, okay, what is the output which you are going getting over here? So it means that the error over here, which you got was uh, 0 0.8, the actual output was zero but you got the error, which is 0 0.8. So it means that in the, in the next iteration, you have to uh, improve that error. It means you need, you need to decrease down that error. So in that particular scenario, you have to work on these weights, which were actually randomly initialized. So the random values need to be optimized. They need to be rescaled or rejudged, and you need to update them. So based on the new data, now you have to update them again. And now you have to see that, okay, what is the output which you are trying to get over here? So now in the previous, you got the output 0 0.8. It means that you told that, okay, this is a, a class one, which is actually wrong, but the actual class was zero. So it means that then you have to readjust your weights and based on the new data, uh, now you have you are back updating your error and you're trying to op optimize your error now. this. Uh, comes you the comes the output that means now the output was one but the error which you found over here is like minus 0 0.1 now you have to again uh, you know improve the error by adjusting your weights based on the error which is coming at the end like the, that very minor point minus 0 0.01 the error is there so it means that we need to uh, do this step again and again maybe thousand times maybe million times uh, again and again in order to get 
to the right output. So it is actually called weight adjustment in our uh, language and in, in the language of deep learning that you actually look into the output and then you try to optimize your weights. And, and the, this game goes on and on actually. So there, there are actually uh, different ways to like uh, optimize these ways. For example, you need to see the gradient descent. You need to see how the weights are optimized, for example. Okay, based on that, when you uh, are using randomly initialized variables, you get some probability like this between both of the classes. For example, you have two classes. One of them are blacks and the other ones are oranges, all right? So you, you try to make a boundary over here. Now, either you can make the boundary upwards or you can make the boundary downwards. Uh, upwards means the class is black and the downward means the class is orange. So it means when you try to optimize or adjust the weights, you try to make the boundary from this to this. So it means now you are adjusting the weights and the boundary is trying to update. Then you again try to update and you look into one by one all the elements, okay, which one is giving us the most error and we try to optimize the outputs. Then you again try to optimize based on some more points again four points again more points and eventually you get the output something like this so now this boundary is there which actually divides both of the classes so all the points all these black points are under the line and all these orange points are above the line so in that particular scenario you got a very good output but this output is a uh, is, is somewhat a problem for us because it's not very much generalized right now. Because if a data point, which is black, and it comes right over here, so the model will give a, a wrong prediction. Or here, or here, or a black, or, or an orange can come. So it means it can give a wrong output because the model is not very generalized. Uh, but the, the, the beauty of deep learning models is that uh, as compared to machine learning models, which are generally, if they overfit just like this, uh, they don't uh, uh, give the right outputs, all right? And they and the error starts increasing. But the, but the beauty of deep learning is that they actually, uh, the, the rate of overfitting in deep learning models is way uh, less as compared to uh, simple conventional machine learning models. Similarly, uh, I also want to cover a little bit of convolutional networks where uh, which actually perform a magic in, in the computer vision based industry or simply uh, any textual data, textual based industry where unsupervised data is there or not. So this uh, com computer vision based industry deals with the uh, edge detection actually. So you are trying to identify the edges from the data, from the from the data, you actually try to where the edge is becoming. So uh, the, the difference between zero and one or the white or the black background, both of them try to make a uh, edge and we try to find that particular edge. So that edge is found with the help of convolution. How uh, we, we produce a set of filters right on the green bar, which is right over there and the input is uh, blue. So basically when both of them combine, so you get a new output. That output is again combined with the filter, involved with the filter. Again, the step, the process goes on and on and on, and you try to uh, rotate that filter into the right direction, and then uh, downwards, and then right direction, and then downwards, and you get the parameters of the outputs just like this. So it means one by one, it's going into the right direction. You are sliding it, and right after sliding, you get the outputs. So it means this particular block, which is over here, uh, when this block is move right and down, it generates output like this. So it, it, the output is over here, which is a whole plane right now. So it's one plus one plus one. Usually the images are in three dimension, uh, the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel, combining all of them makes an image. You try to make a filter, which is three cross three. Over here, you can see that uh, five cross five cross three. It means that five rows are there, five columns are there, and you have three different planes. So all of them combine with the image and then you get the output and the output is over here in the form of 10 different planes. So this convolution gives you the output just like this. So it's, it's a one dimensional plane now, it's a one output. And when you combine all of them, so the depth starts increasing. So this is these are some of the things which are actually the, the, the fundamentals of convolution where you look into different filters and you look into different feature maps. You Those feature maps give you the output, you do the padding in order to find the same outputs and uh, 
match the inputs and the outputs uh, dimensions and that, that's very much important over here in order to find the output. So if you have a lot of filters, it means your video will be producing a lot of outputs. So all of them will be stacked together and right uh, over here, the output comes right just like this. Uh, so based on that, you do the padding to make the outputs, uh, just like the inputs. Uh, in order to match the dimensions, then you have the strides, like uh, how many jumps you want to take, uh, how many steps you want to take in the uh, right or left side. Pooling is a very important concept over here, like you actually should know how to, uh, what what should be dropped, uh, what, what uh, you know, garbage data should be dropped and what uh, should be uh, the input to our model. So that really matters as well. So there are different types of pooling, max pooling, average pooling, min pooling, global average pooling is there in order to like facilitate us to like form the good model in terms of, uh, you know, convolutional networks. Then uh, the, after the pooling, we have fully connected layers over there. This is the whole architecture where you get the input, you get all the convolutional layers along with the pooling layers. They try to find the, make the depth and try to uh, you know, shorten the width and the height of the uh, of your uh, feature map. This this actually is a feature map when you try to implement a filter. This is also a feature map. This is also a feature map. This is also a feature map. And then you provide it to this, uh, and then to try to train the model over here. So over here you make the features, and over here you train the classifier. All right. So in that particular scenario you get the whole uh, data in place, you get the image, you increase the depth and you decrease and uh, decrease the width and the height of the model. So the, the, the go-to goal of us is to like increase the depth of our uh, feature maps or the variables which we are, which, the, which are the drive variables coming from the deep learning models and you need to decrease the width and the height, for example, convert this value into a, a you know, if else condition whether if or else whether the, the value is present or not, for example, uh, the convolutions will increase the depth, the pooling will decrease the spatial dimension. It means it will decrease the, for example, now, before the width was and the height was 32 plus 32, now it's one plus one. Before the uh, width was maybe three, uh, it, uh, I mean to say that uh, red, green and blue channel were there, but now the width is maybe 256. So it means a lot of parameters are over there. So it, 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 it depends upon this part. So convolutions are the prime, you know, uh, building blocks for all these deep learning models and uh, uh, this, this whole ecosystem of deep learning and AI. Uh, and then uh, in order to understand transfer learning or to understand temp uh, temporal data where the time series based forecasting is done, so we, look into uh, the uh, bigger neural networks and LSTMs are there, which are actually uh, another set of um, uh, networks there. Uh, yeah. So coming to the second part, which is basically the, the career uh, perspective over here, most of the data science people are working in the organizations which actually need to make the pipelines uh, in, in an automated way where they need the deep learning models to like get the inputs in an automated way, train the models in an automated way and get the outputs also in an automated way. So that the manual inter interruption in, in all the, in this whole ecosystem should be minimized. Uh, like we should be focusing more on the new problems rather than focusing on the previous ones and trying to make them more, you know, generalized and more accurate pre uh, on, the, on the previous basis. Uh, talking about the uh, career perspective, uh, these days in any organization, when, whenever you go, like now the deep learning or machine learning is becoming a need of any organization rather than, uh, you know, rather than they are, uh, they previously they used to invest to see what's in there. Now it's becoming the need because every organization now needs to find the pattern of the customers, the pattern of the data to facilitate anybody, the, any, any client which he is facing right now. So, uh, all the giants, uh, whether uh, I, I won't specifically take the names of, of the organizations over here, but all the multinational corporates, uh, software houses, uh, startups, everybody is like working these on deep learning and AI, trying to make primitive vision-based products, uh, NLP-based products, 
uh, you know, classification regression based products or, or stuff like that. So a lot of people are working over there. So uh, now we can come to the uh, post answer session. So I have, uh, I think there are, is our hand raised. Uh, yeah. Said you can ask the question. Meanwhile, if anybody has any question, please raise your hands. I I'll be very happy. Hello, sir. Hello. Sir, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, sir. Uh, I'm working in a company uh, where we have a uh, like cybersecurity product, and uh, we have like lots of log files uh, which are coming from different appliances. So it is actually a streaming data pipeline. So what we want to do is we want to build an AI based model to forecast the network flow. Uh, so how we can do it, uh, which features we can use, uh, what type of model we can like, uh, we can use for this particular problem. So can you please, can you please uh, tell me uh, how we can, how we can create a model, an efficient model, which can automate our client and data center where we can like uh, optimally uh, optimally use our resources like uh, the bandwidth management and the memory management uh, by like forecasting the flow of the network and how we can like forecast the flow of the network thank you sir okay so there are two parts of your question one of them is like to forecast the flow of the network actually so over here i can understand uh, like whether you are looking into the traffic of the data or you are trying to uh, manage the memory so uh, it, it it depends upon the data warehouse in the type of the data you are uh, collecting so if you look into the forecasting part so data coming from the live uh, or the or the streaming data coming from uh, let's suppose you are saying the streaming data is there so you must be using uh, spark or you must be using hadoop in your uh, you know organization or if there is any uh, you know uh, oltp uh, sort of data uh, databases there so it, it really depends so if if you are working in spark so i i would uh, preferably uh, suggest you to work on a Spark ML to like make the forecasting models based on the you know time series based. For example, you can use uh, recurrent neural networks where you have to give the already you know uh, till till date data which has the whether you are trying to optimize the memory or you are trying to you know forecast the value of the network which which is giving you the value which is giving you the uh, you know any any particular value of the data. So that needs to be fed to the model and the model can like start giving the forecast based on now. Uh, okay, there, there, there are one or two things which you need to understand over here that any un, you know, conventional uh, spike or dip that won't be catered over here, all right? That particular thing, uh, which is the external, you know, thing which is not fit to that model that cannot be catered rest of everything will be uh, catered over here so that was the answer but but this this needs to be brainstormed and so we, we can sit together to like see how the whole pipeline can be created in order to see like what the data points are there available data points are there and how we can make the uh, you know data stream uh, whole pipeline uh, yeah sm thank you Yeah. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sir. The problem is that there is too much variance in job requirements and uh, job specification. Uh, if we see, especially in Pakistan, so there are different niches. So, to take an entry-level job in machine learning and deep learning, how we mm -hmm. can fo focus and narrow our uh, niche? Like uh, there is one space in computer vision, and there are some jobs in NLP. So how we can uh, focus and develop our portfolio to get an entry-level and mid-level job, especially in Pakistan, because there are uh, job descriptions are too ambiguous. Okay, thank you so much for your question. Okay, uh, I think there are uh, again there are two perspectives of your question. One of them is uh, what should be studied. Uh, okay, think it like uh, the the minds of a recruiter. Uh, he doesn't know right now what the problem is 
going to come. For example, it can be of a textual data. It can be a problem of a CCTV based live stream data. So for example, uh, he wants to hire a person right now who can forecast uh, like the Zads problem. He can forecast uh, a memory management, you know, sort of thing. But after two to three months, now the client has changed and now a new client has come. And that, that new client is giving me a data of uh, national level security. Uh, and you have to find the prime hotspots where the potential terrorist can be. So it means now you have to entirely shift your domain. So it means that uh, if I recommend you or if I suggest you, okay, okay only learn classification or regression in your, uh, you know, a post your bachelor's or post your master's, that would be enough. I would be like uh, wrong over here because these days you have to be jack of all. You have to know uh, all the data sources. If you get, if you need to get the data from Oracle, if you need to get the data from DB2 uh, or Teradata or uh, any MySQL based DB or any unstructured data, for example, you need to know how to get the data from any website by scrapping it. You need to know the data coming from any uh, unstructured data, for example, uh, live stream data for coming from the Kafka or uh, Flow or Hadoop, anything like that. You need to know how to source that data. You need to know the at least the basics of each and every module of data sciences and deep learning to at least make a model, a baseline model to like convince your uh, you know manager or convince your client to uh, that you can. For, make the output or you can make the solution you can improve that solution over time but you should know the basics of each and every problem over there if you are getting my point so it means you know you should know all the the whole data analytics ecosystem and then you have to you know uh, specify yourself okay okay whether i want to be a deep learning engineer in computer vision or i want to be a deep or i want to be a data scientist in nlp only so then it can be deep. okay sir uh, another part of this question is uh, what is the difference between uh, like in Pakistan industry and what are the practices and differences in products based company versus uh, like uh, these are the startups which are product based companies versus the services based companies land based company so uh, can you please give me an industry insight uh, about difference of these two uh, look, the, the question is very, you know, uh, it, we cannot we cannot create a difference between both of them. I can define the roles for both of them. For example, product-based companies are those who have one particular product and you are trying to optimize the product. You are trying to find the good base, customer base for your product. You are trying to uh, get more, you know, revenue from your customers. You are trying to give them better service or you are trying to enhance the experience for those and you are trying to make the models too facilitate the business actually so that's the product based company does then comes a services based company which looks for a particular uh, organization to work for they solve their problems in that particular situation you have to be very you know jack of all the tool stack you have to be very good at each and every each and uh, nitty gritty of, of the data science ecosystem so that that really uh, depends. So if you are working in a product based company, so you have only one thing to focus like for the whole maybe two years. Uh, but if you are in a services based company, which actually provides consultancy to multiple clients, so then you have to be, you know, the, the learning path is way better uh, in that particular uh, situation. Okay, but thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, we have a lot of questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, let me start from the bottom. So uh, where we use weights when we train the sequential models. Okay, so in the sequential models, there are two parts. One of them is if you're using CNNs or the convolutional networks, and then you have multi, uh, you know, uh, fully connected layers are there, multi-layer pressure points are there. So there are two main parts. One of first is the extraction of features and the other one is the extraction of the weights. You decide, uh, you find the optimal weights uh, with them, uh, and those optimal weights or random weights are actually uh, updated based on uh, optimizer or based on the uh, gradient descent algorithm, which actually 
updates the weights on every you know back propagation time so this is the answer for your question uh the next question is uh which api is being widely used in pakistan industry for deep learning uh, mo most of the time these days previously it was tensorflow was very much popular but these days pytorch people are working in the pytorch a lot so pytorch is the go to library these days okay daniel ali wa 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 currently learning business analytics from university of illinois okay started on a course okay uh, daniel do you have any question so please uh, shoot the question Uh, we use gradient descent in order to like update the weights actually it 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 updates the weights with back propagation concept to like minimize the error uh, so you look into the differentials you you decrease the uh, error and you look into the and you see what, what variables are there or what weights are there who actually are participating into that particular error and now you need to decrease that okay so uh, okay do we have any more questions Uh, the weights are the normalized weights we kind of uh, get the randomized weights and then we try to improve those weights based on our multiple algorithms how to see that okay okay yeah so basically ml ops is important so basically uh, the people who are working in devops actually try to uh, you know scale our models to the to the already working environment where, where we are working right now so uh, this is very much important in 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 the industry whether where you should know how to make a model and you should know how to uh, you know uh, operationalize that particular model in the in the framework where you are working right now uh, the 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 concept of docker is a bit different where you actually plug your models into a docker and you make a whole ecosystem and then you plug your your model somewhere uh yeah there are a lot of instances where exeboost works uh sorry dl works better than exeboost uh, in terms of like automating the system and uh, you know improving the precision and uh, overall coverage or recall of the models uh people uh, do companies provide internship in ml or dl in pakistan companies usually provide internships in uh, machine learning uh comparatively deep learning com uh, the companies who provide the, the 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 internships are in deep learning are a little less you have to learn a lot by yourself and then you have to come into the uh deep uh, in in the pakistani market if you want to work in dl yeah recording session will be provided transfer learning always give better results as compared to sequential model because in sequential model you usually use very few layers actually but in the transfer learning models the, the list of uh, you know parameters are way better way uh, you know uh, greater as compared to the simple model which you make so that's why they, they are more accurate uh, any any transfer learning model just uh, for example mobile net v2 is there or inception v3 or resnet one to all of them give it results yeah if any more questions verbal questions are there so please hasan ali yeah you can ask a question uh, hi, um so uh, it's a, it's a quick one um i'm working for a company where we are developing a product um where all the statistical and analytical work currently is done in python but unfortunately they want to standardize everything to java now uh, i wanted to know if there are um, any equivalents to numpy pandas and all of these uh, scipy scikit learn and any of the machine learning and deep learning libraries equivalents in java because i don't really see that many and i've like done all my you know like google research and everything so do you know of any uh machine learning deep learning libraries um equivalents in java and also just for the normal analytics work like the one that you would do with pandas and numpy yeah uh thanks asan for the question this is a very uh you know important thing to understand that uh okay there are two ways to do any work one i i personally prefer to work in uh python why because the thing which 
over here, for example, you have to implement a SPM model to classify two classes in your company for your product. Um, for example, you want to see the base for a customer, uh, for a product that, that this is a potential base and this is a non-potential base for like the purchaser of your particular product. This can be done in Python with only single line of code. For example, you need to just call the data into SPM. You need to put a function, for example, fit is the function and you get the output. But when you try to implement this same function in Java, you actually have to write the complete code of that SVM function. So I think that is way too much pressure on a, on a like machine learning engineer or a deep learning engineer in a company where the tool stack needs to be defined in a very well manner. For example, I, I think if the open source technology is working in Python. So the companies should try to integrate Python with their already made systems. For example, they have any uh, JavaScript based platform. So just try to integrate integration to that rather than trying to make rebuild a system in Java, which is actually available in like very easy way. So I think that's not a good choice, but yeah, I can definitely provide you with the sources of uh, things in Java. Yeah, well, the, the thing is, um, it's it's kind of like a losing battle. We've been debating this for a, for a very long time. I have personally given given them demos and examples on how easy the implementation in Python is and how difficult it will be in Java. But there's just this obsession that everything Java, <laughs> and, and there's not much I can uh, I can I can do about it. So it's kind of like I have to learn Java and I have to uh, basically rebuild all the system within a span of you know just a couple of months. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, I definitely under, uh, uh, get what you mean. Python is very easy when it uh, when it comes to any analytical work, and Java is just not the right tool for it. Besides, thank you so much, Asan. Thanks for your thank you. Uh, can we guys wait for more one minute for Asan, and we'll catch up again. All right, guys, you can ask the questions now. Uh, but guys, we are having some technical questions related to the different models. Uh, we at Dyson Analytics are uh, planning a course of deep learning for AI uh, in upcoming sessions. Uh, uh, the, the management of the deep, uh, Dyson Analytics would get back to you guys regarding the courses. Uh, and if you're interested in the courses in, in this particular course, you can like uh, reach out to them uh, and they will definitely help you guys uh, in registering and uh, all, the, all the details of the questions and practical thing will be addressed over there. So if you have any other query, so please feel free to ask me. 
and uh, we have one last minute to like address the answers and then we'll like close the session okay i think uh, is there any any more questions guys All right, uh, thank you so much for delivering such a great webinar session. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, if you want the uh, webinar recording, you may inbox us on Facebook and also email us on info at Dyson Thank you so much, Atap. Allah, thank everyone. You so much.